Good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, today we have, I mean, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva. He's going to discuss with us uh, how to tackle persistent inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean. As you know, from 1999 to 2009, poverty rates in Latin America and the Caribbean dropped from 53% to 28%, mainly driven by increases in labor income. However, this encouraging trend has reversed during the COVID-19 pandemic when the rate increased from 28 to 30%. In Latin America and the, Cari and the Caribbean, it's unlikely to end extreme poverty by 2030, a goal set by the World Bank as part of the organization mandate. Today, I mean, we, we, we are seeing expected growth rates in Latin America around 2% for the next uh, five years. Uh, debt ratios has can had gone up both as a result of the global financial crisis and after that as a result of the pandemic. World interest rates are going to be high, so fiscal space is much uh, uh, lower than in the past. And therefore, I mean, the fight against poverty is going to be a much more challenging issue uh, for most uh, Latin American countries. So we are extremely glad that Luis Felipe Lopez Calva uh, uh, was able to take a couple of hours from his busy schedule. He's a global director for the World Bank's Group Poverty and Equity Global Practice in the Equitable Growth Finance and Institutions Vice Presidency. I mean, these acronyms are even harder than the ones at the IMF. So <laughs> I'm glad I didn't go to that institution and I, I went across the street. It was at least easier on that account. But I mean, Luis Felipe has over 30 years of professional experience working in international institutions and advising national governments. He rejoined the World Bank in 2022 from the United Nations Development Program, where he served as UN Assistant Secretary and Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean since 2018. So with that, uh, I turn the floor to you, uh, Luis Felipe. We will have his presentation, and then we will open up the floor for a Q&A session. Mm -hmm. sí. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you to uh, uh, Georgetown and the Center for this opportunity. It's always, I was just saying that as a global director, when you talk about poverty, all the focus is on Africa, South Asia, as, as I will show in a minute. So, uh, you know, coming back to, to think about Latin America and the Caribbean, which is actually the area in which I have spent most of my professional career, it's a really good opportunity and great to see also colleagues, friends, and also uh, uh, greetings to all those who are connected. So what I will try to show, no, not try, because this is very Mexican, so I will try, no, I will do, is, um, is I will show you first a global perspective on, on, on poverty mainly, and then I will land on the, what's happening in Latin America, particularly, um, looking at the effect of, of COVID and the, and the aftermath, COVID pandemic. But then also I want to tell you a little bit about what is the approach that we have at the World Bank in terms of how to tackle issues related to poverty and inequality, and even at the end, a little bit of the political economy. So as you know, in 2015, 193 countries in, in uh, in exercise of the sovereign rights. This is very important. So this is not an agenda imposed by the UN. This is something that 
uh, sovereign countries decided to uh, to join uh, um, as a global aspiration. Uh, 17 goals, but very important that it's not trivial to say that the first goal is the idea of eliminating poverty uh, globally. So that, um, among other things, uh, you know, the, the World Bank has the mandate to monitor global poverty uh, formally. And this is what, among many other things, what our practice does uh, at the bank. Uh, we go beyond the measurement, but let me show you some of the trends. So we had a very successful uh, period between 1990 uh, and 2018, uh, in which actually more than 1 billion people were lifted out of poverty globally. So it is important to have this historical perspective because in the context of you know all the short-term challenges, we tend to say, well, there are all these issues and deglobalization and all these that we can discuss later. But actually, um, the, the, the world was very successful at, at bringing down uh, poverty, both in terms of rates and in terms of number of people. Uh, originally, as you know, we keep updating the extreme poverty rate, uh, sorry, the extreme poverty line, which is uh, starting at $1 a day. Now it's $2.15 in 2017 uh, PPP corrected dollars. So that makes it comparable across countries. However, we, we saw already a, a bit of a flattening of, of, of that trend after 2014. So it, it slowed down, but certainly we uh, eventually we, uh, you know, we go to the COVID pandemic. And as we say in the report uh, last year, this is the largest increase in poverty globally since World War II. Um, never seen, we never saw the increase in poverty that we saw due to, to, uh, to COVID. And even with the best estimates, as Alejandro said, we, you know, we try to build scenarios and uh, looking at reasonable growth rates for the world, as you can see in this graph. So this was the sort of the derailing of the pandemic uh, and then we are sort of in the, in the correcting uh, path, but even with the best scenarios, um, uh, we decided uh, globally that three uh, percent would be the goal by 2030. As um, because there is always uh, there will be always transitory poverty. We want to eliminate chronic poverty, the, the extreme poverty. Um, so with these projections, we would be around seven percent by 2030. So first message mm -hmm. is. In a business as usual scenario, the first SDG of ending poverty globally is out of reach, right? So we have to see what we do different. Let's go to, to Latin America and see what how that global shock reflected was reflected in, in our region. Uh, you know, because you have heard many times that LAC was uh, one of the most affected regions, right? It was uh, just in terms of health, um, we have about 9% 9, 9 of the global population, and we contributed with more than one third of total uh, deaths. Uh, one important um, uh, aspect here is that you see that um, not only the, the impact, I mean, you, you see the shock of the pandemic there in that uh, jump in the poverty rate, but something I want to... Uh, um, oh, by the way, this is important because we, as you know, we split since 2011, 12 in the bank, the groups in three, which is, uh, you know, the poor, those that we consider the vulnerable, which are not poor, but have a probability of falling back into poverty in the presence of a shock um, uh, higher than 10%. And then we have the, what we call the middle class, which is basically the economically secure, that, those who are less likely to fall back into poverty. You can see an increase, an important increase in in, in, in most countries for the poor and, and uh, increase in the vulnerable and a collapse or a, or a contraction of the middle class. In that graph on the right, I, the rule will see many numbers, but I will try to highlight some of the points. The, on the right, you see that dotted line uh, compared to the blue line. It's very important to say that the impact was much, much higher in urban set, uh, uh, settings, right? So COVID had particularly an impact on urban poverty. And this is um, the trend in inequality, as you know, in the, the, we, we had a reduction in, in income inequality and we can discuss um, whether that is good or bad for, for certain reasons. But again, we, we observed an increase. In, so at, at the, the trend sort of reversed and uh, the growth incidence curve uh, 
is the first uh, graph that I will show to tell you that the impact of the crisis not only was very important in lack, but it was very regressive. So it particularly affected <clears throat> those at the bottom of the income distribution, okay? As you know, in 2012 or so, uh, we published this book with Nora Lustig, trying to explain this trend. Uh, this was a very, this was a period, particularly starting 2002 until 2000, let's say 15. It was a period of high growth, relatively high growth for lack, um, and reduction in inequality. We can discuss again some of the reasons on the macro side. It was this commodity boom that typically. Um, Bias, you know, it has an effect on relative prices favoring non-tradables, non-tradables like construction and so on are more intense, uh, intensive in low skills. So that pushes the salaries for non-skill uh, up. There are micro aspects related to labor markets. Uh, but what we saw later in 2018, I published a paper with, uh, with Santiago Levy showing that actually that contraction in inequality was mainly driven by um, a, a contraction in the gap between high skill and low skill uh, wages, but unfortunately not bo having both growing, but actually because the the salaries for the high skill were actually falling. So that, so the, in a in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way it's an inequality that is reduction inequality that is linked to uh, lower productivity and low demand for high skills in in, in the re in the lack region. We can go uh, over that a bit later, but it was not necessarily the kind of reduction in quality you would like to see. Um, some more indicators of the regressivity of the of the shock. We see that uh, there was a big change in employment, but particularly affecting female workers, young workers, uneducated workers, and informal workers. So the shock was really uh, particularly harsh on those uh, with uh, lower quality jobs for women and and for young people. Um, what the governments did in many cases, um, it was a very, very proactive reaction trying to inject uh, liquidity in different ways, uh, increasing cash transfers and so on. Of course, the case that has been, why do we exclude Brazil? Because you know that Brazil was the one that really uh, let's say like there was an overshooting in the reaction of the transfers. And actually Brazil ended after the crisis with lower poverty compared to previous to the crisis. But of course that generated a huge pressure on inflation and so on later. But uh, so we exclude Brazil to, to show you this, but all, uh, basically to, um, uh, to, to, to tell you that most of the, of, of the effect uh, was on, on labor earnings. And this is a, an increase in poverty. This is how much of the increasing poverty is explained by these elements and public transfer compensated, but not enough to, to be able to actually um, prevent uh, poverty from going up. We also see in, in non-monetary indicators of poverty, one very important is uh, food insecurity. And here we talk, uh, the, the title says a rise in, in uh, food insecurity, but actually this is just the level, so I'm not showing because I'm not comparing with a previous period. But these are these are levels that were not seen before in the case of Latin America, and in any case, there are relatively high levels of inequality, as you know. Well, you, there are countries like Haiti, Honduras, that is more of a structural problem. But this is so, something that that really uh, matters. So, one thing that I want to tell you is when we think about, and I always tell my colleagues in the in the poverty and inequality or in the bank we say equity because it's positive inequality practice, uh, is that really what we have to think is not about numbers of poverty or inequality, but we have to think about the growth incidence. And what we want to do is to, to understand what is the pattern. If you have here, you have the poorest people, you order people by the poorest to the less poor uh, or to the rich. I don't say the rich because the rich are not really in the surveys, but the, the non-poor and um, and then you see how much income grow, uh, is growing for those different levels, right? So we call that a growth incidence curve. If this has a negative slope, then growth is being higher for those at the bottom. So this is a progressive and inclusive growth pattern, right? If it has the opposite uh, uh, slope, then uh, growth is uh, more regressive. Uh, so we see that in the, in the first 
part of, of this of this century actually growth was progressive. This is consistent with what Nora and I and others showed the reduction in, in inequality. But something that uh, is sometimes, I mean, very few times discussed is how this was changing in LAC. You know, by 2010, 14, this was sort of flattening up. And by uh, the period before, even before the pandemic, the growth in LAC was already regressive, okay? So I think that, you know, that can explain a lot of things that um, are, are, or not can explain, but can be associated to some of the trends in other areas in, in the region. And we have to really, um, as I said at the beginning, we really try as, as economists, in, in this group of economists in the bank, to try to understand the pattern behind, behind this, what is explaining. And I will show you what is the framework that we use to understand that. But I think the numbers that we see in terms of changes in poverty, changes in inequality, um, or other indicators, other standards in terms of, of welfare are really some um, indicators of this shape. What matters at the end is the shape of this graph, how growth is being inclusive or not inclusive. So we care also about the level, of course, of growth, but also about the incidence. Um, so what do we, do we try to understand this pattern? And this is where I want to take a little bit of time because that's more of the conceptual aspect, which is uh, what we call the asset-based approach. There is a paper that we can, you can check that is called uh, pro-growth equity, um, which is sort of the opposite of uh, inclusive growth. This is pro-growth equity, which tries to see the, the process from the other lens. The, the most important message here, and this comes you know, from Hollis Chenery in a, in a book that actually recently we were going back to that. This is from the 70s, Redistribution and Growth. This is a classic book. Um, and uh, the idea is already there. Um, and then there were, you know, the, the main point here is that you cannot, you should not think of growth and distribution as two separate processes. Actually, Growth and distribution and are jointly determined because at the end growth is the contribution of different groups of the of the population to, to income, right? Of course, you can reshape that with the fiscal policy through transfers and other, other instruments. But at the end, what you care is if you, if there is an issue of regressivity or non-inclusive growth, is because the poor, those at the bottom, are not being able to proactively be part of the growth process, right? Why? So this is the framework. The idea is that everybody, every household has these five types of capital. The typical uh, capital we think of is human capital, because this is a, a, one, because everybody has human capital, even the non-educated, and second, because this is more evenly distributed. Um, so education and health, right? But, but we know that there is also physical capital like land, there is natural capital that uh, right now is becoming more and more important. There is social capital that matters um, when we talk about transfers or remittances. This is about having commu a community that, that also um, establishes some informal safety nets. And of course, financial capital, uh, uh, financial inclusion, and so on. Our region is particularly has a very particularly low level of financial depth. Uh, if you think of, you know, from Argentina, that is similar to Central America or Haiti, right? People don't really, uh, they, they, I mean, the money doesn't go through the financial system. Uh, and we know from the 70s, Makino and all this, that financial debt is a very important indicator for the quality and the sustainability of growth. So the idea is how we connect all these people in, the, in terms of these different assets, how they use these assets, and what are the returns. So for example, there is a lot of literature on how much money has been gone into female uh, um, education. I mean, the education of, of women and girls, right? So now we have a big, a big uh, stock of capital, of human capital for, for women, but our region has a very low participation in the labor market, female labor force participation. So that's an example in which you actually have invested in human capital, but the intensity of use of that capital is very low. So it cannot be used to generate income because they're not in the market. Um, think of, of land titling. If you have a physical capital or, or house, you have a house, but you don't have the title of that house. 
So if you engage in a process of, for example, land or uh, uh, legal, legalizing property rights, then that asset in that case could be more intensively used, for example, being used as a collateral to get a loan. So then people can, so we can think of many examples in which we have to understand why the poor are so um, constrained uh, from participating in the process of economic growth. And that explains the shape of that, uh, of that uh, growth incidence curve. So we try to really understand this. And of course, after um, that happens or at the same time, there is uh, taxes, transfers, and subsidies that reshape. Uh, of course, they also determine part of the labor for participation. There is a, a general equilibrium element here. But the point is, you, we can think of taxes and transfers as, as reshaping the the, the, sh the 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 growth incidence curve. Okay. Um, okay. So if we think of that. Uh, of course, the market structure and macro conditions matter particularly for uh, the returns, right? So think of, I mean, sorry, but Argentina is always a good example. Uh, so I will refer to Argentina. So when we talk about relative prices completely distorted, no, uh, that affects, uh, in this case, also the returns to uh, to all the assets. Think of three types of relative prices, relative prices of goods, durable, non-durable services. These are just inflation. This completely distorts those relative prices. And you don't know what is the cost of a service versus a, a car because uh, the, the adjustment, in the process of adjustment of those prices become really distort. Uh, and then decisions cannot be made. Think of that as a dashboard. You have a dashboard in the car and the, the signals you are getting are completely confusing. So what you want to do is maybe to stop, not to continue. And that's what's ha what happens with the economy. So that's between you know goods, services, and so on. Inflation completely distorts that. Second would be... Um, the, the relative prices of today versus tomorrow. That also affects interest rates, which is basically the relative price of today versus tomorrow. Should I save? Should I invest? All that gets also distorted. And finally, the relative price of external versus in, uh, domestic goods, which is exchange rate. All that gets, uh, and of course, we have a, a, a basic expression that relates all these three through the interest rate parity and so on. But basically, the idea is that we really care about the macro context because the returns are signals for the investment to accumulate assets and also for the use of, of those assets. So this is a framework that we want to use to try to understand what is happening here. And then we focus, of course, on the uh, you know this at the bottom and say, so what are the constraints that the poor are um, facing to contribute more actively to economic growth? And this is what we try to do in our in our poverty assessment. So the, the prospects for, for recovery, uh, if we think about labor markets, which is uh, one of the best indicators for that. This is a change. We have something that we call the job quality index that has seven characteristics, including if you have, if you have access to social security, if you have uh, wages that are above the poverty line, the, you know, there are seven, seven, uh, seven uh, dimensions and then we look at employment. So these are changes between 19 and 21. And you see that most countries are in this area. So the quality of employment decreased and the level of, of employment decreased. So interestingly, you have Argentina there, but most of the employment there is public employment. So in that sense, of course, this is high quality, uh, but we, we then have to ask the question, what is the productivity of that employment, right? But certainly, uh, we see that after the shock, we are recovering. The level of, uh, of employment has recovered, but we are ending um, with a lower quality of, of employment, higher informality, and so on. And that is basically, that doesn't seem to be a shock that will be temporary, but rather something structurally uh, seemed to have, to have changed. As you can see here, the change in formal employment and self-employment is not in the direction we would like to see. And also the change in employment by firm size that, you know, Santiago has really uh, analyzed this in detail. Um, and also Marcela Slava recently in a paper with Marcela Melendez. Um, 
So uh, what we uh, are very important to say that the the actual poverty line that we use for the most of the countries in LAC is 685. The 215 is too too low. So basically doesn't really mean anything for LAC for, because we have higher uh, middle income countries. So we take basically 685 as the poverty line, which is the one that we use for higher middle income countries around the world. One, one important uh, number that I want you to keep in mind is that if we take this poverty line, which is still not very high standard, 47% of the population in the world is below that. So, so economic growth is a very serious, uh, very important first priority we cannot think of growth as not being um, as not being relevant, and of course we make it. We have to make it compatible with other goals. The, just for you to know the standards, the six eighty five to fourteen we call it the vulnerable, and uh, fourteen to eighty one, the middle class. This comes from the analysis of actual transitions in and out of poverty, and then we map. You can see the paper Journal of Economic Inequality two thousand eleven. The methodology is explained. We map. Um, a probability of falling into poverty with actual transitions for countries for which we have panel data, and we ma map that to income. And when we, we set the threshold in 10% probability of falling back into poverty, which is arbitrary, but we do some sen sensitivity analysis, and it happens to be at the level of um, $14 per person per day, okay? And of course, we get a lot of criticism from sociologists. We, rightly in a way say that economies simplify, you know, being middle class to an, to an income standard. We of course don't claim that the, that's the only thing that matters, but uh, economic security is an important aspect of being middle class. Let me uh, skip a little bit because this is, this is just the effect of inflation that we expect to be very high on poverty, but I want to go to a bit of, of the way forward. No? So the, in the way forward using this framework, there is one particular element that, um, uh, we think that is one fundamental building block for uh, the way of inclusive growth and lifting constraints of, for people to um, um, to contribute more actively to growth. And this has to do with the social protection system. We can go into more details, but the bottom line here, very aligned with the work of Santiago Levy, but not only that, um, four characteristics that we have to completely rethink because at the end, uh, I'm using also this because the, uh, the talk is about how to tackle inequality and poverty in Latin America. We think that the first step is really to think about how to reshape or redesign social protection systems in Latin America and the Caribbean in a way that are, for example, uh, independent from job status and so on, more with general um, in a general package of social protection that is also also financed through non-distortive taxes and so on. But the idea is that it has these four characteristics. One, that is universal. Universal in this case would mean that you will have a basic package of social protection independently of whether you have a job or not, or independent of what kind of job you have. There will be elements as a job specific that should be part of an additional element in the social security system. But the, the fundamental package uh, would be basically universal, but when we say inclusive is that sometimes we need to target to actually guarantee universality. Uh, so some targeting would be needed or for certain states of the world in the sense, for example, if you fall into poverty, then you have the right to get a transfer or some type of assistance that that is the kind of inclusiveness and targeting that would be needed. It has to be growth friendly because part of the problem now is that the social protection systems make formality uh, very expensive, or, or rather make it more uh, uh, economic, the economic rationalities to, be, to stay informal. And that uh, makes, has an impact on productivity and growth. And then it has to be, of course, fiscally sustainable. One of the aspects that Latin America is always in trouble is, is how to increase the capacity to sustain uh, fiscally uh, part of this program. So, that would be a first building block that could really eliminate a lot of the macro microeconomic distortions. So in that sense, that's why we call it pro-growth equity in the sense that it goes from tackling poverty and inequality 
to start building the, the, the conditions for economic growth. Um, among other things, because we always think of, of um, in this sort of uh, polarized economic situation in which we have very large firms and we tend to think of you know foreign direct investment, connection to um, connection to the markets and so on. So that's more in terms of the within country with, with sorry within firm productivity. So exposure to trade, for example, this is for large firms. But we have to think about uh, between firm productivity, which is reallocation of resources from smaller to larger firms, for productive firms to grow faster and so on. All that could be facilitated by this type of social protection system. And But how to get there? So I close um, with, uh, I think I, I'm actually on time exactly. So let me close with this. Um, this comes from, it's a summary of the WDR 2017 on governance and the law at the World Bank, which basically tells us that this is the infinity loop of governance and try to see how we can actually try to change that. Because part of this is how you, I mean, if you know what to do, why it's not done, right? Uh, so why policies fail? Uh, in the same spirit of Asimov and Robinson, why nations fail, here is why policies fail. So basically the idea is that uh, policies and institutions are agreements among actors, right? And those agreements take place in this that we call the policy arena that could be formal or informal, Congress, uh, lobby, uh, lobby groups, elites, and so on. And that leads those um, agreements among the actors, which are policies and rules, have an impact on the nature of the economic growth, the shape, the ideological. It's either like this or very low, very high, like, or, or very uh, progressive or very regressive. And that actually, what we call the outcome main, that feeds back uh, with the fact of power. What, that, what does that mean? If you systematically, your agreements, your policies, your rules, systematically concentrate income in a specific groups, those groups acquire the fact of power. And of course, in the policy arena, we'll be continuously distorting this policy, right? Um, I hope if it's not clear, I can, I'm happy to give you examples also. But basically, in an economy that generates very concentrated uh, and regressive growth, systematically, some actors will have a lot of influence in that policy arena and will continue to protect those kind of policies and rules. But in that policy arena, you also change the, or define the rules, which is the rules game, and that could actually change formal law. And that eventually becomes the jury power. So not only uh, you have more influence, but also you change the legal system in a way that perpetuates the influence of certain groups. And the, you know, all the discussion about why inequality is inconsistent with a, with a functional democracy, well, it's related to this. Inequality that is systematically generating concentration of income gives the facto and the jury power to specific groups, and you are trapped in a loop of governance that generates a progressive growth. So this is uh, where the poly power asymmetries are expressed. And, and this is why the 2017 WDR was so controversial because when we presented this, we used to say, you know, we're presenting this to a, a group of economists that when you talk about power, they can only think of electricity. Uh, because we never think of the importance of power uh, because it seems to be more of sociological or political economy or political scientist concept. But actually that report tries to look at the micro foundations of how power asymmetries, we economists, we talk about information asymmetries, we talk about these kind of distortions where power asymmetries can actually sabotage good policy, right? And we give a lot of examples of that. So that's that's what keeps you in that in that infinity loop of of uh, negative outcomes. So you have to think about what are the rules, what are the policies, and who are the actors. During COVID, there was a lot of discussion about what, whether there was a possibility for change. I think the jury is still out, uh, but in the as a more and Robinson sense. Crises are opportunities for change because they redistribute power. Crises are exogenous, an exogenous redistribution of power. Um, so you have to think of whether you can uh, deal with rules, policies, and actors in a different way 
So you have to create basically coalitions, right? And I, with this, uh, you typically can explain change. If you go back to history, for me, one of the best analysis of comparative politics is um, the origins of political order by Frank Fukuyama. I think this is a very nice example of that. So you see examples in which change is brought about by coalitions among elites, those who are very close to the decisions. Sometimes they are brought about by, by uh, coalitions of elites with citizens. As Frank actually says in, in that book and in other papers, there is no example of peaceful change that doesn't involve some coalition between elites and citizens. Um, it, it always requires that kind of, you know, a, a, a breakdown of, of, of elites and some members of the elite actually have a coalition with citizens and that brings about change. That's the only way to bring about change. So, and this is a bit of, um, um, uh, you know, perspective from international organizations because they always say, no, it's, it's the World Bank and the IMF are blamed for <laughs> all the bad things that happen. But we always, you know, in that report, we say change can only come from domestic agreements among actors. The only thing we can do is use the instruments we have to try to uh, rebalance that that power locally. Um, so we have something that we can call development assistance failure, which is if we, if through your instruments you uh, reinforce an equilibrium that led to the outcome that you were trying to change, of course you are not going to uh, bring about change, right? You have to use the instruments in a way that sort of create more competition in the political arena. Maybe this was a little bit uh, too much uh, because it's a change from the economics of that to a, to a little bit of the political economy. But I did want, did want to end with this. Um, because the question is always when, why, uh, if we know what to do, why it doesn't happen, right? And I think we have to think more of, on the on the political economy and of this, uh, and what are the constraints, what are the rules, what are the actors, who are in the elites uh, uh, more likely to, to have coalitions with citizens and so on. Uh, and that's the way we can explain a little bit more change. But okay, so we can, you can download, download some of our reports here. Um, but thank you for the opportunity. Now I went a little bit longer than I thought, but uh, we have some time for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Yeah. We can, we can take uh, questions from, from here. I think you... you, uh, you yeah. No, that's fine. I mean, I mean, I mean you started from, from a diagnosis and then you ended up moving towards a, a, a much more political economy and sociological view on how to make change happen. But but maybe you move too fast in 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 saying that we have the right diagnosis, no? So uh, I would like to go back first to that point because I mean also also politically it's very hard that in Latin American democracies today you will have the political power to do all of the things that you want to do. And, and you kind of went from, from a, a, our income distribution problem to, to the issue of a, informality and social security and et cetera. And, I'm, and it seems that in your research, you have moved a little bit on the opposite direction. I mean, with Santiago Levy, you started maybe several years ago being significantly convinced that a, a non-linearities in the tax and, and, and social protection structure generated informality and that was one of the biggest causes of informality. And I think in your latest paper, you give a broader, more holistic view of the causes. <laughs> so in a way, is it, all of this to say, if, if you had the power to pinpoint one or two reforms in, Latin, in, in some Latin American countries to improve income distribution, you would still focus on those that tackle informality or you will go to labor market reforms 
other labor market reforms, unions, no outsiders or insiders or mar market power that some studies uh, from Mexico kind of said, look, if you're able to reduce market power uh, or close a, a concentration by, by half in key sectors, you can improve income distribution or poverty levels by a significant amount. So uh, uh, if you look at education, you look at access to, to security and justice, you look at health, you look at informality and you look at a, a market power and finally you look at labor markets how would you decompose a, 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 our bad income distribution into those key dimensions as drivers of inequality in latin america okay so that's a, that's a very uh, comprehensive question but i will try to give some elements as, as a reaction first reaction and I will use the example of um, uh, Bolsa Familia, Bolsa Escola, uh, Oportunidades, because that at some point were seen as, as very important and it, they are still very powerful in, in, uh, in terms of the objective they were trying to achieve. So the logic behind those programs that they were, was, were eventually distorted is the idea that you uh, the idea that you break down the intergenerational transmission of poverty uh, by investing in human capital, the assets again, and by investing in assets, health, education, but also you do it by providing an immediate relief through assistance, uh, giving cash, but the cash is conditional on the investment in those assets. So in that way, you are trying to uh, uh, mitigate the current situation by transferring income but doing it in a way that would um, reduce the, the the level of poverty by making these uh, the children of these families more productive in the future, you know? and that worked in the in terms of those objectives. You saw that the education increased, health was improved, and so on. But what happened that there was no demand, right? First, um, you can also think about the quality of the education and so on, but which is very important. But also, but but the fundamental is that if there is no demand for that new human capital, uh, then there is not going to be any effect. And so the long-term uh, evaluations of these programs show that the issue is that these people didn't have jobs or didn't have better jobs. So that's, that connects again with the informality idea. So in a way, you are intervening on the supply side uh, by, by investing in human capital, but the demand side continues to be the issue because there are no, there are no, um, firms, productive firms that grow and so on. And that's the, why the evolution goes also from the purely social protection to an, uh, a more holistic in the sense of what is the tax system that is creating distortions for firms to grow? What are the uh, institutional or, or contractual or legal aspects that are making the firms unable to grow? No, the typical example, if you have five or six taxi taxi drivers, uh, you will always thought these are examples of very small firms with one with one person, I mean, self-employed, and they generate very low productivity. If those get together and, and build a transport company, then you will need a lawyer, then you will need an accountant, then you might need an engineer for logistics, and the productivity could increase. And then you can also afford to adopt certain technologies that maybe you cannot adopt as, right? That's just one, that is just one example that gives you an idea of the type of, of issues that for some reason we don't see happening. So that means that you always have very, even for highly educated people, it's in low productivity jobs, small firms, they don't adopt technology, they don't grow, they don't become more productive. So that's why we went to the other side, which is the demand side, right? And then when in that paper in World Bank Economic Review, they, the story is we simulate what would have been the inequality in, in, in wages uh, in the case of Mexico uh, if the size distribution of firms was consistent throughout the economy for the formal firms, no? And then, of course, inequality would have actually increased. Why? Because of what I said before, there would have been a demand for higher skills. So what we see in Brazil, Chile, Mexico, um, um, the the, the the countries for which I've seen data, the wages for tertiary educated people are going down. Not only the returns, but the level of wages, right? So that comp compression of wages between low and high skills 
it's explaining the reduction in inequality mainly, but that is a problem because the issue is this, this um, people are not getting a productive job. They, they cannot use those skills. So given that we need to break the segmentation of, 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 um, of the labor market, not by looking at informality as a policy variable, we, not by formalizing firms, but by removing the constraints that make the small firms uh, unable to grow, which have to do with you know quality of the judicial system. I mean, it's a relatively small firm um, can go bankrupt if they have a labor um, uh, dispute, for example, right? Why? Because it's super expensive, very high, low quality. Uh, wh whereas large firms can afford to eventually get to tribunal, I mean, or the, to um, a justice of higher quality because they can always appeal to higher instances. So, um, so small firms are, so all these legal, fiscal aspects are really on the demand side affected. So for bottom line for me now, the story is more on the demand side right now, more than on the supply side. But in one forming which you, you can affect or start moving in the direction of affecting the supply side is by uh, creating this social protection system that doesn't, where firms can hire you without the tax that is involved in. So it's a labor market reform also in a way, because what you are saying is, okay, you have a, a universal non-contributory pension, you have health insurance, you have uh, a I mean, unemployment insurance could be more linked to, to, to your job, but you have certain, uh, I mean, uh, life insurance, which you know, there is no moral hazard there. So you have a package of, of, of uh, basic things in which everybody has that, that package, regardless of where you work or where, or where you work. And that could be financed through general taxes. You know, that are typically regressive. You, you can say that they are regressive, like consumption taxes. But if they go to finance this, basic social protection system that really makes it cheaper for firms to hire workers. So that's one first step in that direction. So that's why we say it's not a solution, but if you ask me one thing I, we, we would push for, for uh, a reform would be to really think about these uh, social protection systems with universality, but also how we, they are financed is very important. If the firms continue to pay to contribute to that, it will continue to be a tax and I could make it very expensive. So that would be a first step, but there are, I mean, other things that we can discuss. There is a lot of discussion on the quality of education, for example, and we are criticized because they say, oh, you are saying that investing in education doesn't matter, and we're not saying that, but we're saying that this is not the first order constraint. Because uh, if, we, if there was really a lack of skills, what you would observe is actually an increase in the price of high skills. And you see the opposite in the data. So there don't seem to be a lot of demand for high skills and a constraint in terms of, you know, people not being, even for the top 1% in terms of education, we did an exercise, even for top 1% from the best schools, the wages are not going up. So there is no demand, you know? Very good. Perfect, but no, 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 no. Questions? So we have two questions here. Just a minute. And Thank you. This is all, all very interesting. And and you bring up Brazil. I've spent a lot of time in Brazil and thinking through the the not just Brazil but all Latin America, regressive taxes across the board. Um informality of businesses across the board. But opportunities um that were taken advantage of to to such as Bolsa Familia, which happened in the commodity super cycle. You know, there's an opportunity, there's a lot of money. So government's able to do it, but of course. You know, forcing people to go to school, but the schools aren't that great. Uh, so I, I get where you're coming from. I guess the question that I really have is as we move towards an opportunity, which there's a challenge right now with Ukraine, there's a, there's a challenge after COVID with supply chains nearing, ne needing to near shore, friend shore. Um, the fact that it needs to be more diversification of access to grains. You have Argentina and Brazil, obviously, very big, but Latin America itself could be much bigger in providing grains and foodstuffs to the world. Like how, from, from the outside, how do you break that loop of entrenched elites 
okay, in the case of Brazil, for instance, making it extraordinarily difficult to hire or fire anybody. That's most of Latin America, but I think about the Brazilian context, it's very difficult. Therefore, there's no demand signal to hire people into these positions. If there's this opportunity that we have to, to bring back into the hemisphere these types of, you know, maybe it's, it, it's computer chips or, again, in the grains, certainly they're big strategic minerals as well. How do, how do we get that demand side, as you called it, um, uh, rationalized? How do, you, how do you create more formal economy that's taxed in a more progressive way that leads to a, to a more uh, virtuous cycle rather than the non-virtuous cycle we've seen? If, if In my head, my question is clear. It may not be clear to you. Hopefully it is. Answer. <laughs> But, but I can tell you that um, precisely how to endogenously create this connection of, of the of the internal value added no for even if you think of of near shoring benefiting Mexico because firms would go closer to the largest market and so on, which is going to happen, the question is where, what is the the connect the connection I mean the backward linkages of that kind of investment, whether you can really create supply chains locally um, and that I mean, when some people would tell you industrial policy or as they call it now, smart industrial policy, uh, which is basically trying to deliberately create those those uh, uh, supply chains. Uh, but the other is also removing these constraints so firms can actually grow and compete and uh, and increase. So I think that polar polarization in terms of the size distribution of firms um, shows that, that that missing middle in a way is that disconnect, disconnect between... Uh, uh, no, the, so at the end you have large exports, but with relatively low backward linkages domestically, and that, I think that is a key question. No. Um, I think Peru is a good example, very, very prototypical of Latin America, you know, in the sense extractives generating the engine of growth. Uh, then a lot of people in low productivity service sector, um, territorial inequalities, which are, I, I think, in, in the case of Peru, are very important to address as, as priority. Um, of course, also labor market uh, issues related to uh, um, segregation, related to to uh, ethnic origin and and so on but I, but i think um what you say about the the houses not being finished so they don't pay taxes i think i can tell you that very well finished houses don't pay taxes uh, so I, I so one of the areas of opportunity for uh, you know alejandro may know better this but um uh, property taxes which is a, which is a one way of wealth taxation um is very um, underused in our region. Uh, and that could uh, impact uh, at least locally service provision, quality of service provision and so on. The quality of services is very important because when we talk about coalitions, uh, in countries in which, for example, public education is universal, uh, you have a solid coalition protecting the quality of education. That doesn't happen in our region, right? Um, because basically, as, as soon as you can afford it, you opt out and you go to the private services, right? In, the, in Central America, there are more than three times more private security personnel than policemen, right? Even that service is already privatized uh, because you opt out. Um, when we presented the middle class or mobility report 2012 at the bank, 
we went to present in Brazil. The, the Minister of Education told us, I, I firmly believe in, in, in te standardized tests and the quality of education and so on. Uh, but he said, for me, the indicator of success is when the middle class comes back to the public school. And I think that's a very, very important point because when middle, if you have high level of ser quality of services and middle class comes back to the public services, they have incentives to pay taxes, they have incentives to protect the quality of those services. So this is another type of dynamic, so investment in, in quality services. One point that we see recently, for example, that sometimes the measurement is seen only as measurement, but I think really matters. One example that we are looking at recently, take two examples, Colombia, Mexico. They are the pioneers in terms of multidimensional poverty measurement, but Colombia uses multidimensional poverty as a tool for policy coordination. So every sector says how much they're gonna to contribute to the reduction of multidimensional poverty, the poor. So what you see in Colombia is in 10 years, a bit more than 10 years, 12% reduction in multidimensional poverty. Um, very important uh, path. In Mexico, there's all discussion about monetary poverty going down. You know, if you take the official information, monetary poverty went down more or less at the level that it went down from 98 to 2006, let's say, right? So similar in that reduction of poverty, but accompanied now in the case of Mexico by a collapse in non-monetary indicators of poverty, health, education. For me, it's surprising that people are not talking more about that. They're discussing whether it went down or not in monetary terms, and they are not discussing. And the difference with Colombia is very interesting because in Mexico, the multidimensional poverty measure is only measure, but it's not used for policy uh, planning. So it's just one example. So I think sometimes also the way the way you measure um, uh, matters. So maybe, maybe a second aspect in which after doing this social protection mechanism, a second potential instrument to generate a virtuous cycle of low inequality and coalitions and so on is the quality of basic services, fundamentally education and health because that really can, uh, you know, create incentives for people to, to protect those services and so and, and pay taxes. Hi, um, I think you have already answered my question, but I wanna post it anyway. Um, I've worked all my life, most of my life in cash transfer programs. And I think we did our, our work in terms of post um, distribution inequality I mean, after this, the government comes and put money in the pockets of people, distribution improves a little bit. Um, but I keep thinking about pre-distribution inequality, the actual ability of people to make their own ways without needing the government. And it seems to me that doesn't change, that that is not changing. And it's probably because of the demand thing that you already said. Uh, and sometimes I'm, when I'm very dark in the future of my continent, I start thinking that probably the only way in the future is to have a universal income, um, universal uh, basic income that actually some very few people makes the money and it gets redistributed among everybody else, but it's not the kind of future you would like to build. So what are your comments on those kind? The money. <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, two, two aspects. One is um, the reduction in inequality that we see in lack in Latin American Caribbean, uh, mainly Latin America, I would say, uh, is driven by labor market. So it's not about redi the redistribution. Yes, the incidence of, of public spending improved in the last first two decades, uh, mainly because of these targeted programs. And that explains about one third of the reduction. In but the other two thirds is about labor market. So we still, we have to go back and see what is ha happening the labor markets and some of these elements I mentioned uh, might not be so positive. Others, others are positive because the level of education of the of the uh, economically active population has increased. So there have been also positive uh, elements there. But I have to say that we were under the uh, idea that improving the targeting of these programs was enough, good enough. Um, the question is. There's one hypothesis that made, you know, when we see the growth incidence could make sense is there was no real redistribution from the top to the bottom with these programs. 
there was a little bit of at the margin either either it was this windfall uh, and that was used with better better targeting or it was at the margin taken out of better quality services for middle classes to go for these for these better targeted programs and you see all the you know the turmoil in Brazil Chile and so on middle classes sort of were left behind in terms of um uh, so the, the redistribution was more from middle class to the poorest rather from the top to the poorest. I'm not saying that's the case, but that you know the, there are papers that that claim that that is that is the case, and that would explain sort of the political also the political economy uh, of certain uh, processes that we've seen recently in the region. But the bottom line is, you need to still labor markets play the key role when we talk about inequality. So. In that sense, what I mentioned about the assets, the work, the functioning of the markets, and so on, matters a lot. You can do Latin America, yes, has a relatively a redistributive system, but it's very small. If you see the level of, I mean, Brazil, we were talking about Brazil. Maybe Brazil has too high tax collection or too distorted, but they, it's a, the only one that really collects, you know, more than thirty percent of GDP. But in general, the system, yes, it is. Really, uh, the incidence is is uh, progressive, but it's a relatively small uh, uh, system, so it doesn't really uh, explain a lot of the changes in inequality. What really explains is how much you invest in education, in health, and in making the market work better. Thank you, uh, Luis Felipe. A great, uh, great presentation. Just a quick, very quick question. On this uh, picture that you have on the reversal of the progressivity of growth, is this a figure that Latin America shares with other regions? You will see the same thing in Africa and in Asia. And if that's the case, uh, what's the specific about this story about for Latin America? It's, it's, it's something that you will generalize to other developing countries. So what's really, really specific of all of these that you're talking for, for, the, for the region? much more analysis. So at this point, it's a fact. Uh, if you see other regions, I can tell you, for example, Africa is not that pronounced. Um, I think Europe is a bit similar. Uh, and actually, in the case of Europe, there is this work on the vulnerable, how do we call it? In Spanish, it's vulnerabilization. <laughs> uh, the pre precarization, I don't know how to call it, uh, of the middle class, right? Uh, that in Europe has become uh, more expensive to be middle class. The, the, the threshold has increased. So in a way that um, it has become more polarized in terms of the income distribution. Um, but I think this is particular characteristic of Latin America. It has, I mean, it, it, it requires more analysis, but some of it has to do with the macro cycle, as I said. So the, the impact on wages for low skills and so on. Um, uh, but I think it's something that honestly that requires more, more analysis. But it, it's a very interesting fact. So. If we don't have another question, I'll make a last one. Especially when you're looking at post-COVID evolution of poverty, for Central America, Mexico, and some Caribbean countries, what has been the role of remittances to mitigate poverty, given the huge increase we've seen in remittances? Have you, I was a little bit surprised that, especially for the last four years, there was no mention on the role of remittances in, in mitigating uh, poverty uh, uh, increases in, in these countries. Uh, it's very heterogeneous. So if you look at remittances for the whole region, the impact was uh, uh, that it reduced the impact on poverty, but it was relatively small, but very heterogeneous. So you see, Mexico, Central America, it was much more important than in others. In general, for Mexico and Central America, um, the link to the U.S., not only in terms of remittances, but economic links to the U.S. has played a very important role in the in the recovery. Um, the, the, the thing that is still to be, uh, and actually the, the recent WDR on, on migration in general raises this question in one of the, of the vignettes, that Something we still have to understand is the discrepancy between the macro data on remittances and what the households actually get in remittances. Uh, in El Salvador, in Central America, and in Mexico, 
there's a huge discrepancy. If you see all the remittances, you add up all remittances that households get, uh, and you compare with, uh, of course, there is there is under um, um, reporting and so on, but you know the, the the discrepancy is so big that it's difficult to. So I think the part of the perception that remittances may, may have played a more important role is because we see the aggregate number. But when we look at the micro, yes, they play a role, but it's not as important as you might think. Yeah. Luis Felipe, thanks for your overview in terms of world poverty dynamics in the last 30 years, and then the focus on Latin America, and also the discussion on how to fight poverty in the next decade, and also the, the very important uh, points you made on the political economy of how to forge consensus to to change the economic model uh, for the economic model to be much more inclusive than what it has been. Thank you very much. And thank you for the comment.